Today I'm going to speak on a topic. It's, it affects us all during our life. It's where do you go to when your world's falling apart? It's something that we've all... Okay, it's something that we all go through. Obviously the, the electronics aren't with us yet. It's something that we all go through as a part of our life's journey. So where do you go to when your world's falling apart? You go to the one who made the world. So the first point today is that um, we go to the person of Jesus. So let me tell you a story. In 2020, a lady came for prayer in prayer chair on a Saturday. She sat down in Brighton and I just prayed. I remember I had a word for her. I spoke into her life um, and gave her encouragement. I don't you know, fully remember the exact thing because I pray for a lot of people over the over the year, over the years, and I don't always remember who I pray for. But a year later, she came back to, she came back to visit me in prayer chair and she said to me, I've got to tell you a story. And I said, right, because I did remember this time. I, I did remember, oh, I prayed with her a year ago. She said, I came to see you a year ago and you prayed with me and you spoke into my life and and." I was down in Brighton, I came down to kill myself. He said, I came down, that was gonna be my last walk, just to go by the, just to have a last look, and then I was gonna go down to the pier, and then I was gonna go back to my hotel, and that was it. And she said, I saw you bored. And so I said, you know, okay, I'll just sit down and just see. And she said, after that, you just spoke, you spoke into my life and I made a decision for Jesus. I now go to a good church. I now go to a home Bible study. I'm studying the word and I'm going on with life. And I was just, you know, quite taken back because I'm glad she didn't tell me because that would have been a heavy burden to try and carry at that time. But obviously God knew, and in her desperation, in her midnight hour, she came to Jesus. She took, she took that last glimmer of hope, and she invited Jesus into her heart, and everything changed. And just to give a little bit more on Michelle's story, that, I've st that her son wasn't saved, he was wayward, he's now come to Jesus. She's now got a good career. Things are going on in their family and it, God's been really moving profoundly in her life over the last four years, five years. So it's been quite remarkable. But then let's go to the Bible. And I want to talk to, have a look at Matthew 8, 23 to 27 because this is when Jesus is in the boat. Now Rodney spoke a little bit on this last week but I've got a slightly different uh, angle to look at this this week as we as we look at this and this is when there's a huge storm so if we look at Matthew 8 23 to 27 I'll read the NLT version the one you'll see behind me is slightly different but then Jesus got into the boat and started across the lake with his disciples suddenly a fierce storm struck the lake with waves breaking into the boat but Jesus was sleeping the disciples went and woke him shouting Lord save us we're going to drown Jesus responded, why are you afraid? You have so little faith. Then he got up, rebuked the wind and the waves, and suddenly there was a great calm. The disciples were amazed. Who is this man? They asked, even the winds and the waves obey him. But you know what? The apostles set a fantastic example for us because they awoke Jesus in the middle of their storm. They came to Jesus when things were getting tough, when they realised they needed to go somewhere. They came to Jesus. They came to God in their midnight hour and God made a way. Jesus made a way. The waters were calmed and they got to the destination where they intended to be. And in our midnight hour, we all need to come to Jesus. And in the Bible, they often call to this and to come into the upper room. Because when we come into the upper room, we encounter his presence. Because in the upper room, all things become possible. Because in his presence, we encounter his glory. We encounter 
what only God can do. Because, you know, in our midnight hour, we receive bad news, but you know what? It's not the end of the day because God knows how to show up in your midnight hour. And, you know, midnight hour comes to all of us at some point in time. I don't know what it looks like for you. It may well be that, you know, you've lost a job or you've had a bad prognosis from the doctor. You know, we've got children who you're you, you know, unable to have children or we've got wayward kids. You know, business has gone wrong. Whatever it is, you know, midnight comes to us all. And whether it's in the past, present or future, we will all hit that point in time when we, when we find ourselves in that midnight hour. And, you know, I don't know how you handle it. I don't know how you deal with it. Like for me, I just probably need to just, you know, find a quiet place and just kind of try to unpack it and work out, you know, get my thoughts together. But you know what? The most important thing about the midnight hour is how you respond to it. It's what you do at that time that is so important. Because you see, the devil turns up and he wants to disappoint you. He wants to tell you that you know, you're a failure. He wants to discourage you, tell you that you're no hoper, that you're a loser. He doesn't want you to look to God. He wants you to look at your problem so he can then create all types of havoc in your mind and create scenarios which will never ever happen. He wants, you to, he wants to divert you away from God's purpose for your life. And, and by doing that, he wants to bring you a place where there's no hope and no future. But you know, God, he knows how to turn up. God will turn up. He will turn up in your midnight hour. And it's in that point in time we will encounter his power in our life in ways we did, don't expect or we never thought possible. And this is a second point today. We need to encounter the power of God in our midnight hour. And in 2019, we were praying for a man in prayer chair. And this guy was in a wheelchair and he was desperate. He, his, his girlfriend was wheeling him about and, and he had blisters the size of footballs on his leg. I remember he, he rolled up his trouser leg and they were gross. They weren't even bandaged up and it was, it was awful. And he was fully medicated. The doctors had given him as much painkillers as they could. They said, we can't give you anything else. And he was still in pain. And so we started praying for this guy. We started praying for him. And then all of a sudden, he started saying, what have you done? What have you done? Because he, all of a sudden, he said, the pain has gone from my legs. He said, they're gone. What have you done? And we said, this is the love of Jesus is reaching out to touch you in your point of need. And so he started stamping the ground with his leg <laughs> you know what's going on and I said do you think you could stand up do you think you could do a you know just take a couple of steps so you so he helped him up he did a couple of steps and he even did a little tiny jog he couldn't believe it so then when we decided to share the love of Jesus it's no need to say that he was willing to accept Jesus into his heart as his personal Lord and Saviour and his girlfriend said, that's the first time I've seen him smile in two years. So, you know, the power of God is demonstrated all the way through the Bible. He turns up in ways we don't expect. And he knows, he knows what we need when we need it. And I want to read now a passage where Paul um, brought a ma young man back from the dead in Acts 20, verses 7 to 12. And in fact, it's quite unique because it's the only time we read in the Bible that where Paul actually resurrected a young a person from the dead. So on the first day of the week, we gathered with the local believers to share in the Lord's Supper. Paul was preaching to them, and since he was leaving the next day, he kept talking until midnight. The upstairs room where we met was lighted with many flickering lamps. As Paul spoke on and on, a young man named Eutychus, sitting on the windowsill, became very drowsy. Finally, he fell asleep and dropped three stories to his death below. Paul went down, bent over him, and took him into his arms. Don't worry, he said, he's alive. They all went back upstairs, shared in the Lord's Supper, and ate together. And Paul continued 
talking to them until dawn, and then he left. Meanwhile, the young man was taken home alive and well, and everyone was great, great, greatly relieved. Now, the power of God raised this young man from the dead. I can just try and imagine what Paul was like. When he went down, there was a young man. He would have been, he probably laid himself over him a bit like Elijah because they only had the Old Testament to refer to. And we read in the Old Testament when uh, you know, Elijah breathed into the young boy, he laid himself over. So he would have laid himself over this young guy and said, Jesus, Turn up. We need you, God. We need a miracle. Lord, breathe life back into him. Lord, I'm preaching to these people about your power, your miracle working power. Do something. And as he prayed, this man would have taken a breath and the resurrection power of God entered this young man and brought him back to life. So today, what do you need? What resurrection power do you need in your situation? What power do you need in your life to turn around something that you're struggling with, a difficulty that, you know, on the outward, outside everything looks fine, but you know on the inside things may not be as great. Come to Jesus today. Come into the upper room and encounter his power where all things become possible because your miracle is on the other side of your greatest problem. Your greatest midnight hour is a miracle in waiting. And often we need to remember that the darkest hour of the night is the hour before the dawn. And you know, when we look in the Bible and it speaks about the midnight hour, all the references lead to a breakthrough and to a dawn and the beginning of something new. So that midnight hour of struggle is opening the pathway to something great that God has for your life. And the third point I want to talk about today is that we need to join with the people of God in our midnight hour. Because if we look back at Paul in his midnight hour, he was in the upper room and it was a place of fellowship where they were breaking bread. And often in our midnight hour, we want to pull away, go to our own place and take and deal with it in our own. But you know what? We need to be found in the body of believers. And I'd like to share with you a story. I don't think I've shared this one before. Um, when my father passed away, and um, it was actually, he, he passed away on, on Valentine's Day. Um, it was 1994. Remember my mum said my dad always had a bent sense of humour, only he'd think of dying on Valentine's Day. But um, we were going, about six months before that, we'd heard that all the pastors from our church, I was lived, we lived in Melbourne in Australia at that time, and they were all going to Adelaide, which is seven hours by car, it's in a different part of the country, and they were all going to see this guy called Rodney Howard Brown. They hadn't heard much about him, but they knew wherever he went, there's fires being started. And so they were all gonna go out and check him out. They didn't tell anybody, but uh, the, the, the senior pastor's wife, um, her best friend used to work for me, so I got all the goss in the office. And so I knew they were going, so I said, if they're going to check him out, I want to be there too, I want to go. And so Lynn and I had organised tickets to go to see, to see him in Adelaide, and we'd, we'd organised it, and the, the dates we were going to go was on the, the 16th and 17th of February, which is about two days after my father passed away. We'd, so obviously, when Dad died, I said, you know, we cancelled everything, cancelled our booking, cancelled, you know, we, we were going to drive down, we just couldn't do it. I'd organised all the funeral arrangements the following day, and I remember sitting at home, and uh, my, my young girls were only Kelly and Chloe, they were, um, I think, seven and five at the time, and Mum said, you know what? why don't you just go? Because Dad's funeral's for a couple of weeks later because he had friends from other parts of the country that were going to come down. She said, just go and, um, and leave the kids with me because they'll just help me take you know, my mind off Dad looking after them. That'd be really good. So I said, okay, wow, you know, this is pretty sudden notice. And so I remember at that time we had, I had frequent flyer points and I thought, what about an off chance? I rang up the airport and said, well, I've got these frequent flyer points. Normally they said, you, you know, you can get a flight in three months' time. I said, what's the chance of getting a, a flight to Adelaide tonight? I said, well, if you can get to the airport in, 
in an hour and a half, we can put you on there. And I thought that was an absolute miracle to start with, you know. So anyway, Lynn and I rushed home, threw a sort of a duffel bag or something in the back of the car. We drove to the airport, just left it in valet parking, just because no, no time to organise cabs or anything. We got there to Adelaide and we got to the place of accommodation. And the guy said to me, and I remember when we, you know, I rent, went, I rang up and apparently our place was still available. They still hadn't, the room wasn't gone. And the guy said to me, you know, the strangest thing, I've got to tell you, he said, this conference says there's about, um, Adelaide's not a big place, there's about 7,000 people going. And he said, the phones rung every day, people looking for accommodation. But the, when you, ca the last call I've, I've, the last two calls I've had were from you. One, to cancel your booking, and then a day later to rebook your room. He said, it's really strange. He said, the phone has been going off the hook until that happened. I thought, well, this is odd. This is strange. So then we went, so we went into the meeting, and, um, and I remember there was, I was sitting down, and you know, the worship started, and I just couldn't focus. You know, I was just struggling with my grief. You know, I was, I was close to my dad. I loved him very much. And, um, yeah, I was just struggling. And then all of a sudden, I had this picture. I saw a heart, you know, like one of those. And um, uh, this is a red one. But then I also saw the finger of God coming down like this. I could see it. I was, could see it coming down. And I was just watching. I was just watching this while well, praise and worship was going on and everything was going to back and I was sort of with my tears sort of trying to struggle. And then I was watching it. And as soon as the finger of God touched the heart, I just burst out laughing. I just burst out laughing and I couldn't stop. And Lynn was looking at me like an alien saying, he never laughs, what's going on? <laughs> you know, um, because they're, they're, all the music has stopped now and I'm just still laughing, laughing, laughing. And it was, it was quite profound. I just didn't know what was going on until afterwards. And then, then we saw some friends from church, some of the other people who were there. And uh, one of the friends came up to me and said, I'm so sorry to hear about your dad. I said, oh, that's all right. I said, what? What? I just felt God had lifted the sting of death out of my heart. It hadn't changed the way I feel about my father, but all of a sudden it was like he died two or three years ago. It was like I'd gone through that intense grief. And that was a divine miracle for me. I could not share that at home because mum would have thought how cold and callous. But that was something that God had did for me. So in my midnight hour, God came up and he gave me a a gift, as a precious gift for me in my struggles. And in our darkest hour, we also need to be with other believers because that happened because I was in God's presence. I was there with other people. I, was, I still came in into the body of believers. And you know, if we look at verse eight in the previous passage you just rest, um, left about, we can read that in the upstairs room where they met, it was lit with many flickering lamps. And, you know, we're called to be the light of the world and we all have our own light. But the devil wants to snuff out that life. He wants to put that light out. He wants to stop you from progressing with the things that God has for your life. But, you know, when we get back into the upper room, we can get our candles can be lit because did you know that a candle loses nothing from lighting another candle? And so in our darkest hour, we need to come up into the upper room. We need to come up into that place where we can encounter God, we can meet with Jesus. And the upper room was also really a special place because we read about it in scripture, we realize that it's a place also where Jesus used to take his disciples and he used to give them greater revelation because in the upper room we learned about the washing of feet. In the upper room we also learned about the greatest gift one of, you know, to God gave us in the Eucharist, the Passover meal. We can read about it in 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 26. For I, for I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread 
He gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup of the wine after supper, saying, this is a cup of the new covenant between God and his people. It's an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you're announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. Because the breaking of bread is where we come together and share communion. It's an important reminder of the assurance that you and I have in our God. It's a reminder that in Jesus we have been forgiven, that in Jesus we have been made righteous. In him we are healed. In him we have grace before a mighty God who is merciful in every way. It's a reminder that we have the victory over death, that Jesus has a victory over demonic, that we have victory over oppression, over sickness, disease, over poverty. That's what the breaking of bed reminds us of, the victory that we have been given in Jesus. And the upper room is a place where we need to come together to take part in the victory feast and remember that God has a victory in our life over every situation. And the fourth thing, uh, the fourth and last point I want to talk to today about is that we need to hold on to the promises of God because God's word is full of promises for our life. There are thousands of promises for every situation and we need to hold on to those promises. We need to know uh, uh, what promises that we are believing God for in our situation and grasp that. And, and it takes me back to um, 2000 and, um, eight and nine during the financial crisis I lost my job I was out of work for almost a year and it was probably the most difficult time of my life it was it was horrendous it was an awful time but yet God used it for his purposes because I found that the only way I could actually cope was to spend the mornings in praise and worship just pressing into God spending time in his presence and then in the afternoon, I would then do my job hunting, look on the internet, try to find jobs. And funnily enough, it was a place where I was so close to God, yet my world was falling apart around me, but yet I was very, very close. And it was also a time when, when God connected me with other people, because it was a time when I started prayer chair. I started with the fellow who worked in, who, who started prayer chair on his own back in 2007. I met up with him and um, I then began, I became involved with prayer chair and I kept it going in because he left in 2013 for personal situations and I kept looking after it with a team of other people. And it was also a time when I started writing daily devotionals to encourage others who are going through different times. And it, was, it, and it was quite remarkable because actually um, the way I found my job was not the way I expected to. So when I was going through my struggles, funnily enough, Lynn was also looking on the internet at work when during she had a moment to spare, she'd have a look and see if she could find a job for me. And anyway, she rang up and said, what about this one? This sounds really good and uh, it's got a phone number. And, and I said, oh, no, well, give me the email address. And I said, them. She said, no, it's a phone number. Ring them up. So I thought I would, I said, fine. So I, I remember this, I was, um, I rang them up and I said, hi, my name's Michael Farkas. I'm interested in this job and uh, I'd like to apply for it. And I said, oh, we've already seen your CV. I said, excuse me, um, I don't think I've applied for this job. They said, no, we found your CV on the internet and we had a look at it and, you know, we need A, B, C, but you didn't have D and E, which we're also looking for. And I said, well, that's a generic CV. I've been doing D for three years and the other one I've been doing for a number of years as well. And so I said, oh, really? I said, yeah. I said, oh, in that case, I'll put your CV back in the pile because in 20 minutes we're going through to talk about those people we want to bring in for an interview. So I thought, oh my goodness. So next thing I hear, I get an interview. So I got called into an interview. I sat in a room with a number of different people were in there. And 
yeah, the interview went okay. You know, it went for about three quarters of an hour and uh, I thought it was a bit short actually because normally some of these interviews can take a lot longer. But anyway, I remember I was um, on the train, I was going home and I was praying and I said, Lord, I just need your favour, your favour, your favour, your favour. I need that breakthrough, Lord. And as I was praying, the phone rang and I said, oh, we'd like to have you back for a second interview. And the rest is history. And, and you know, I, I, I got a job and I worked with them for, you know, I was with them for over four years, four and a half years. And it, it was remarkable, you know, during that time I did incur quite a bit of debt, which took me quite a few years to pay back. Obviously, when you're out of work, you've got to, still got to pay mortgages and different bits and pieces. Also, during that time, it was a time that I started cooking. I thought, I'll, I'll help Lynn with the cooking because I'm at home. Bad mistake, because Lynn said, I've been cooking for 22 years. Hate it, you seem to be good at doing a good job now, so you can keep going. So I've now <laughs> chief cook and bottle washer. So, but when I look back, I realise that God had to take me out of what I was doing. He had to say, I need, he had to interrupt my life and give me a readjustment so that I would do what he wanted to do before he would plug me back into the work I needed to support my family and keep going. Because if I hadn't have gone through that time, I wouldn't be involved with prayer chair and I'd say probably none of you who are involved with prayer chair would either today. I don't think it would have continued. I think it would have stopped 10 years ago. I wouldn't have been writing daily devotionals, which I still keep doing now, about four days a week. I, I email, text, WhatsApp them out to people all over the place. And through that ministry, working with you know, a wonderful team of people. We've impacted the lives of, for Jesus. Many, many, you know, we've prayed with thousands and thousands of people over the years. That never would have happened. So when I look back at the purpose of God in my midnight hour, I realize it was to show up and do only what he can do. When he said, Michael, it's time for you to go back to work. He, there, I just try to think of the coordination in the spirit of those angels who prompted Lynn to find that job, to push me. This guy already had seen my CV. You know, what's the likelihood of all those things happening in such a tight, precise manner? It was, you know, you got a better chance of winning Euro Lotto. And that's... You know, and that's honest, you know, when I look back, I thought that had to be God's divine power. And that's what he does in the midnight hour. He demonstrates his power in our life. He comes to you and reveals yourself in your situation. Because you know what? God is not asleep. He's not asleep in your situation. You may not hear him. You know, he's not surprised by what goes on in your life. He's not going, oh, I didn't see that one coming. Oh, well, I never. No, he knows exactly what's coming. And because, you know, you're here today, he knows the outcome. He knows that you are going through to the other side because he has a plan and purpose for your life and nothing that you're going through is going to stop you from fulfilling the purposes he has for you. Because, you know, the crazy thing, I was just thinking about this, that, when God created a plan and purpose for your life, he knew your flaws. He knew that you'd be born on the wrong side of town or you'd be going through a difficult family or the situations you're going through. But out of that situation, out of going through life as a rock, he's going to create that diamond of beauty. He's going to create that fulfillment in your life because he has a wonderful plan and purpose for every single life. You may not see it yet, and you may think, oh, well, God, what can you do with me? It's time to start think, stop thinking about my limitations and to start thinking about God's possibilities because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And you may be still waiting for God to show up in your situation, and you may be seeing other people getting answers to prayer, but keep pressing in. 
Don't stop believing because your answers are coming. God is going to turn up in your situation. And if we look at one plight of desperation in the Bible, when we look at Acts 16, 24 to 26, this is a midnight hour for Paul and Silas, which also revealed what was in them. So the jailer put them in the inner dungeon and clamped their feet into stocks. And around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And um, other prisoners were listening. And suddenly, suddenly, there's a massive earthquake and the prison was shaken to its foundations and all the doors immediately flew open and the chains of every prisoner fell off. Because God showed up in a way that no one could ever, ever have expected. Because God is a God of the impossible. And what was amazing was that here they are, they are singing for joy in prison, now praising God. Now I reckon that place would have stunk, it would have been horrible, it would have been absolutely awful, and singing and praising God probably wouldn't have been the first thing I would have thought of at that time. Um, but yet that is exactly what they did. They pressed into God and they knew that God would bring the victory. They did not stop believing. And in their praising of the Lord, in their worshipping, in their lifting him up, in their place of desperation, when, they, when everything in their world was falling apart, they were clamped in the inner room. They were, they were destined. They were destined for them to have, you know, the, the world had something else in store for them. But God said, no, I have what, what I want in store for your life. And God turned up in their midnight hour and the earth shook and God's glory was displayed. And everything changes when we come into the presence of the God, when we come into the presence of the Lord. So when you praise God, hold on to his promises, worship him and believe, never stop. Because I guess in summary, because a midnight hour will come to all of us, whether in the past, whether we've been through it, whether we're going through it, or in the future, there's some time we're going to come into that place. And so when you find yourself in the midnight hour, you need to find yourself in the upper room. When you find yourself in the upper room, you need to find yourself with people of God gathered together. You need to be in a, in a church where people love the Lord, where they believe in the word, and also join into a cell group, get, in, get plugged into different home groups or network groups where you can come together, where you can pray together and support each other. When you find yourself in the midnight hour, you need to be gathered in the upper room with others, breaking bread and sharing with others. You need to be encouraged. We need to be strengthened, which we can do when we come together. When you find yourself in the upper room, when you find yourself in the midnight hour, you need to be on your knees in prayer and you need to pray and you need to pray and you need to pray and God will move in your situation. You will see his power move in your situation because God will turn everything that the devil is meant to harm for good in your life because I still believe that dead people will be raised I believe that blind people will, be, will, will see, deaf people will hear. I've seen enough miracles in prayer chair to know that God is real and he's still doing today what he did yesterday. I still believe the power of God can be made manifest in the goodness of your life. I still believe that people will be saved. I've seen life-changing decisions made by people and, and it's an incredible privilege to see when God actually changes a heart and a person, you just see them when they've opened their hearts to Jesus. And you see Jesus has come into their life. I've seen lines disappear off faces as people cried and let the tears of emotion go. Lives have just changed forever. And I still believe that the midnight hour is our greatest opportunity to see God show up and reveal himself to do a miracle in our life. So in that midnight hour, you need to know that God is still there to bring healing into situation for whatever it is, for the prodigals to come home, to repair that broken relationship, to turn around your financial or your work situation, because God is 
who he says he is and your midnight is coming to end and your new day is just coming, will be beginning. Because if we look in Matthew 19, 26, this is in the, in the voice version, it says, Jesus, people cannot save themselves, but with God, all things are possible. So what's impossible with man is possible with God. So where do you go to when your world is falling apart? You go to the one who made the world. So today I'd like to just pray that if you're going through a difficult time, if you're struggling or if you're in that place today, I want to pray that God's going to move in your situation and he's going to bring a turn around, that you're going to see the breakthrough that you're believing him for. Because your day is not going to, your night is coming to an end. God is so much more. So Lord Father God, I just pray today. I pray, Lord Father God, that you'll move in every situation, in every circumstance. Lord, that while we look at, you know what goes on in the heart, Lord Father God. You are the one who knows our struggles. You're the one who knows our difficulties. You're the one who sees tears, Lord Father God. You're the one who knows, Lord Father God. And we just thank you that you're the miracle working God who shows up in our midnight hour to bring that breakthrough. You're the God who shows up. You're the one who delivers us. You're the one who heals us. You're the one who sets us free. And we thank you that you've created us to be the head and not the tail, that it's your desire that we walk in victory in every situation. And Lord, today I just pray that for those who are struggling, that you will move powerfully in their situation. We break off any demonic strongholds in Jesus' name. We speak, pre we speak freedom to the captives. We bind up the brokenhearted and we loose those people who are struggling today, Lord, in Jesus' name. We pray freedom. We thank you, Lord God, that nothing is too difficult for you, that you are the God of miracles, Lord Father God. We just thank you today. We thank you, Lord God. And today, if you've never asked Jesus into your heart, today can be the beginning of a fresh start. It's really simple. If you'd like to invite Jesus into your heart, just say this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I invite you into my heart today. Please forgive me are the things that have disappointed you and help me to walk in the fulfillness and the blessings and the abundance that you have for my life. I ask you, Lord Jesus, to walk with me now and forever, never to leave me, to be by my side, to guide my steps. Lord, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Let me know your ways. Let me live in the joy and the freedom and the liberty you have for me. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If anyone would like prayer today, if you, if you would like to you know, lift up your hand and I'll see if, we'll see if there's anyone around you who can come around.